This is the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, episode 049-CE. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast designed to help you learn the essentials of blood banking and transfusion medicine. My name is Joe Chaffin, and I am your host. I'm super excited to share my conversation with Dr. Jeff Winters from Mayo Clinic today about cytophoresis and why it's important for you, even if you aren't actually responsible for it. More on that in a second. But first, continuing education credit for this episode is provided by Transfusion News. That's transfusionnews.com with generous sponsorship from BioRad, uh, who has no editorial input, by the way. Like all episodes, this podcast offers a continuing education activity where you can earn the following types of credit. And here they are. One AMA PRA Category 1 credit, one Contact Hour ASCLS PACE program, and American Board of Pathology Self-Assessment Modules, or SAMs, for maintenance of certification. To receive credit for this activity, review the accreditation information and related disclosures, you just have to visit www.wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news. Now, with that out of the way, I had Jeff Winters on last year, and he gave us just an excellent overview of therapeutic apheresis, as well as an in-depth look at thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Today, Jeff is back to talk red, white, and yellow with me. You confused? Well, red just means red cell exchange, white is leukocytophoresis, and yellow is thrombocytophoresis. These three procedures are things that may need to be done emergently in many, many hospitals. And in fact, those of us in the blood bank may not even be the ones doing the procedure. However, these procedures impact us in ways that we might not even realize. And Jeff wants to share his vast experience and tell you what you should know about these procedures. Now, as always with Jeff, we'll move fast and give you lots of practical information. So I don't want to wait, make you wait even a second more. Let's go. Here's my interview with Dr. Jeff Winters. Jeff, welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. It's great to be back. I'm looking forward to chatting with you again. It's uh, it it, honestly, you know, I, I am always honored when people who have talked to me before are willing to come back, which means you're either, you know, just a terrible masochist or, or we had a good time last time. I'm going to choose to think we had a good time last time. That's what I'm going with. It, it was a good time. I, I enjoyed it immensely and I'm looking forward to chatting again. So I, I will put into the good times. Okay. Fair enough. Thanks. Uh, thank you for not shooting me down there, Jeff. That's, that's cool of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so everyone, Jeff was with us, uh, last year in 2017, where we, we talked, uh, a lot about the, the fundamental principles of therapeutic apheresis. That was in episode 25. Um, and we also in episode 26 take, took a look at very specifically one of the, one of the very clear and well-defined uses of therapeutic apheresis, in particular thrombotic thrombocytic Cytopenic purpura. Today, uh, I've asked Jeff back to, to take us through uh, some additional stuff with apheresis, in particular the use of apheresis to remove to remove some cells uh, from the from the blood in terms of cytophoresis, and to talk a little bit about red cell exchange as well. But Jeff, before we get to that, I think we ought to do just a quick thumbnail review. Uh, are you up for that? Just a little quick thumbnail review of what we yeah, talked about before. Good. So last time we focused mostly on plasma exchange, removing plasma, which really is the biggest chunk of apheresis procedures. The stuff we're going to talk about today, removing cells, less common. So the important thing to remember is that when you do an apheresis procedure, again, the definition of apheresis is derived from a Greek word, take away to separate, remove by force. That's what we're doing. We're taking blood components, we're separating them, we're returning some back to the patient, and some we're thrown away. So uh, the ways that we can separate blood into its various components are they're, they're essentially two. We can use filtration, okay, where we're separating based on size, or we can use centrifugation, where we're separating based on density. Now, last time when we talked about plasma exchange, either of those methods could be used for plasma exchange. This time, we're only talking about centrifugation. So blood is going to go into a centrifuge, it's going to be spun, and it's going to layer out according to the density. So the most dense elements, the red cells, are the farthest from the axis of rotation, and the least dense elements, the plasma, are closest to the axis of rotation. And this time, since we're talking about removing cells, specifically, we'll start off by talking about removing white cells, they're going to be in the middle band, in the Buffy code, and that's what we're going to focus on. 
Awesome. Awesome. Okay. And that's, uh, th- that's a, that's a really important thing for everyone to understand. If, if what Jeff just said to you guys is, uh, not making sense, we went into that in a ton more detail in episode 25. So please stop this, go back and listen to that. If, if, if that was, if that was all, uh, I don't want to say Greek because <laughs> aphrasis is a Greek word, right? It fits, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so go back and listen to that if that didn't make sense. But Jeff, one of the other things that we talked about in that, in that, uh, those two podcasts is something that, that we're going to use today. And so I think people need to know the, the very quick thumbnail descriptions of the, the American Society for Aphoresis categories and grades of, of how, uh, essentially how we're using aphoresis and, and in particular diseases. Could you take us through that? Yep. And, and I will, as we go on, talk about particular diseases or particular indications for the cytophoresis and mention those. So that is really important. So first of all, the issue is that there's not much literature and much of the literature is poor quality. So ASFA, the American Society for Aphoresis, reviews indications for aphoresis and assigns each procedure as it's applied to a specific disease an ASFA category and a recommendation grade, okay? So the category is the role of the treatment in the treatment of that disease, okay? So there are four categories, one through four, and they're written with Roman numerals, just mentioning that because I see people putting them with Arabic numerals. No, Roman numerals. Category one is a first-line therapy, either standalone or conjunction with other therapies. So what that means is when you see that disease, the first thing you should think of is applying that particular aphoresis treatment. Uh, the, the, the big example is what we spent uh, time talking about, and that's uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, okay? Category two is a second-line therapy, either standalone or in conjunction with other therapies. So what a category two indication means is that you do something first. And if whatever that treatment is that you did first doesn't work, okay, then you can add the aphoresis treatment onto that, okay? Category threes. The role of aphoresis is uncertain, and essentially you should individualize it doesn't mean that aphoresis doesn't work. In fact, there is literature that says it does work. But what you do is you don't necessarily treat everyone with that disease with the aphoresis procedure. So you're going to look at your patient and you're going to make your decision based on characteristics of that particular patient, okay? Uh, And then the final category is category four. And basically, aphoresis doesn't work or is harmful. (laughs) Um, And so that's the... Don't call me. Um, <laughs> procedures. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, they can be done in the context of uh, of, of, of an IRB-approved research protocol where you're investigating something. But, but really, outside of that, the literature does not support the use. And again, it, it may actually be harmful. Then in addition, there is a recommendation grade. One is a strong recommendation to do the procedure. A two is a weak recommendation to do the procedure. And then with that, you're going to see either an A, a B, or a C. An A is high quality evidence, B is moderate quality evidence, and C is low to very low quality evidence. So A is randomized controlled trials, B is controlled trials, or flawed randomized controlled trials. And C is uh, case series, case reports, uh, expert opinions from people. Okay. So so the... Everyone, we will have the, uh, I'll have a link to the current version of the, uh, the ASFA guidelines that, that Jeff was mentioning. Those, uh, those are out there published for, you can, you can grab a copy of those. They're, they're really truly excellent. As of this recording, uh, the most current one, Jeff, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe are the, those from 2016, uh, that are the most up to date right now. Is that correct? That is correct. It's uh, new editions published every three years, so look for a new edition June or July of 2019. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, so I don't want to spend any more time on that, Jeff, because we, we need to get on to, to what we're here to talk about today, which is, uh, well, let's start with cytophoresis, with getting rid of some of those cells that you were describing before. So what do we want to get rid of first? Well, let's get rid of white cells first, okay? So let's cool. talk about hyperleukocytosis, Okay. Um, so really, hyperleukocytosis is an elevated white blood cell count, and usually a white count greater than 100,000. Um, now, to be honest with you, 99.9% of the time, this is going to be due to the presence of a leukemia, okay? There, there are times that you can, and I personally have seen elevated white counts for other reasons, but they tend to be zebras. They tend to be pretty rare, okay? 
Now, when you get these extremely elevated white counts, especially in the setting of uh, AML, acute myelogenous leukemia, you can run into some troubles. And the troubles can be really divided into three categories. And these are hyperviscosity, leukostasis, and tumor lysis syndrome. So when we talk about hyperviscosity, basically there's so many white cells there circulating through the bloodstream that, that, that the blood becomes, you know, like, uh, yeah, well, you know, like molasses in January here in frosty Minnesota. It uh, is moving really slow. Yeah. And the end result of that is you're not perfusing end organs. <laughs> Similarly, you can have leukostasis where there are such high levels of, 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 of white blood cells in there, and they're interacting with the endothelium through adhesion molecules that you're actually occluding the microvasculature, and again, you're leading to end organ uh, hypoxia. So we talk about those two, or I talk about those two as being separate entities. It's really hard to distinguish, okay, because they're leading to that same sort of endpoint, which is you're going to see individuals that are going to have neurologic abnormalities, okay, so they may, for example, uh, have signs and symptoms of stroke or uh, TIA, um, uh, um, and, and they may range from, from very mild symptoms to, to complete uh, coma and, and, and being completely obtundent, okay? Um, the other um, uh, thing that can happen with leukostasis and, uh, and hyperviscosity is that you can also have such poor flow through the microvasculature of the lungs that these individuals essentially do not oxygenate. There is no oxygen exchange occurring, or, or there is oxygen, but it's not being delivered. So what's happening is, is the oxygen diffuses from the alveolus into the capillary. It's not making it out of the lungs. And in fact, there's so many white cells present that they're consuming all the oxygen. So these people will, will have these horrible, horrible blood gases. They'll be profoundly hypoxemic, and they can have actually an alveolar capillary block. Okay? Now, because of the combination of the microvascular occlusion, these neurologic symptoms that can occur, the hypoxia in the tissues, you can also end up with hemorrhage. So you can have bleeding into organs, and, and the one that we worry about the most is actually uh, bleeding into the brain. So you can see somebody with um, not only may their neurologic symptoms be due to um, the, the, the hypoxia of the brain, but it may be due to actually they're now bleeding into the brain uh, because of the damage to the vessels from the hypoxia and subsequent hemorrhage into it. You can see other oddball things. Uh, you can see bleeding into um, the retina, and you have infarction of the retina, um, and, and bleeding into other sites as well. Um, the tumor lysis syndrome happens when our colleagues, the hematologists and oncologists, show up, and they begin to give the chemotherapy. I mean, their goal is to kill off these cells, and sometimes they're a bit too effective. Okay? <laughs> so suddenly you have massive lysis of, of, of white cells throughout the body, and you have the release of the contents of those white cells. And so you're seeing potassium and phosphate and uric acid being released, um, as well as all of these you know, breakdown fragments of the cells, bits of membrane and things that can, can trigger the coagulation cascade. And, and you'll have all of these potentially toxic materials um, leading to the development of uh, disseminated intervascular coagulation and, and leading to renal failure um, and because of you know, uric acid deposition, for example, as well as electrolyte abnormalities that can cause a myriad of other things such as arrhythmias in the heart and all that. So, Jeff, let, so, let me interrupt you for just a second. I'm yeah. sorry about that. But uh, like, no when, we, when we go back to, to leukophoresis, uh, sorry, for, to leukostasis for just a moment, um, you mentioned that the definition of hyperleukocytosis is a white cell count of, of greater than 100,000. Um, I have uh, I have seen people when in when they're dealing with a leukemic and uh, and that white count is above a hundred thousand that that seem to think that that it's automatic that they're going to have that the patients are going to have symptoms. Uh, are there are there any variables in that? Is it you know I, I mean I I know the answer that you, when you cross a hundred thousand some switch doesn't automatically flip. But what are the <laughs> what are the things that people should be thinking about to try and make that evaluation when the count starts getting that high? We'll talk when we get to the end about what the ASFA categories say, but the, the bottom line is what we really want to treat when we do these procedures is we want to treat symptoms. So in other words, if somebody is symptomatic, right, 
I really don't particularly care what their white gum is, okay? I want to treat it. Wait a minute. Can people be symptomatic at less than 100,000? The answer is yes, because what also determines it is not just the white count, but what types of cells are they, right? And how good's the plumbing? All right. Okay. Right. If this is a young female who has the protective effects of estrogen on their vessels with regard to atherosclerosis, okay, they may have no symptoms at an extremely elevated white count. Whereas if it's some older gentleman, and I'll put myself in that category, who might have bad atherosclerosis and has gummed up vessels and that carotid doesn't look very good as it is, they may have symptoms at a much lower white count. So symptoms really need to drive it. I alluded to the differences in the cell types. As a general rule of thumb, and you know those are general rules, interpret them, you apply them with caution, right? Uh, Acute myelogenous leukemia tends to have symptoms at lower white counts, okay, because they're bigger cells with more adhesion molecules expressed and more interaction with the endothelium. So they tend to be that 100,000. ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, tend to be much smaller cells with fewer adhesion molecules. They tend to have much higher white counts, 500,000. So, you know, to be honest with you, I don't do the prophylactic reductions until they're hitting much higher counts in the 500,000 range if they're ALL. And then CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, okay? You know, in the chronic phase, uh, those people can have incredibly high white counts and are completely asymptomatic. So essentially, I do not treat chronic phase, uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia um, with, with cytoreductions. reductions. On the other hand, if they're blasting off, if they're developing an acute leukemia out of a chronic, you need to treat them as if you were treating an AML. Okay? That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Good. Okay. So, uh, th- thank you for taking that little, that little sidebar with me. I know we're going to talk, I think we're going to talk more about the, the specific indications when we get, uh, when we get to the section on the, the ASPA categories. But what do we know about how reducing these white cells actually helps patients and, and what is, what does it do for them? Yeah, what does it do then? Well, you know what? There's good news and there's bad news. And and I guess this depends upon whether you're a, a cup half full or a cup half empty sort of person. Um, th- we know this, that when somebody has a white count greater than 100,000, they have a higher short-term mortality rate than in those who have white counts less than 50,000. And that's due predominantly to bleeding into the central nervous system and pulmonary leukostasis, which I mentioned, that, that sort of alveolar capillary block, okay? So you'd say, oh, hey, 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 this is great. We can reduce this white count, right? We can, we can take these cells out. And interestingly enough, when you apply leukophoresis, okay, you can lessen or reverse symptoms, and it's associated in a number of studies with improved two- to three-week mortality, meaning that they survive in that two- to three weeks after diagnosis, there's a higher survival. But when you look at their overall mortality, that means did they survive their leukemia? There is not an effect of leukophoresis on overall mortality. That's going to be determined by what type of leukemia they have, what type of, uh, you know, bad cytogenetics, good cytogenetics, and all the rest of that. How healthy were they before they developed this leukemia, okay? So back to the pessimist optimist, if you're the cup half full person, and, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm, I'm a half full person. I would have uh, guessed that. <laughs> uh, when I look at it, I say, hey, I'm going to do this procedure because at least I'm going to give them a bit of a fighting chance. I'm going to improve their survival for two to three weeks, and hopefully my colleagues in hematology oncology can, can help them. Now, if you're the cup half empty person, you're going to say, it doesn't make a difference in their long-term survival. Don't bother doing the cyto reduction. And there are publications, and there are people that, that believe strongly about that. And I just throw that out there. I think a little bit of medical judgment and a little bit of medical practice. I'll let the the, the listeners decide for themselves. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I like it. Well, okay, so so we'll get to the specific recommendations on on what to do, but let's talk about the technical stuff for just a minute. And and I, I realize that uh, you know a lot of the people listening to listening to this podcast are are uh, people that may never actually have to deal with the technical aspects, and that's fine. But it, I think it's important to to understand a little bit about it. So what what happens? How's it done? 
Yeah. So again, we're back to that centrifugation again. So we're going to go ahead and pump blood into our apheresis device. We're going to spin it around and we're going to separate it into layers. We're going to have that plasma layer near the axis, red cells outside, and uh, in this case, a really large buffy coat, right? It's going to be full of all these uh, white cells, these leukemic blasts that have been generated uh, coming out of the marrow. And what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to remove, obviously, we're going to try to remove those leukemic blasts to decrease the total white count. And our goal is going to be to decrease that white count so that we can decrease the leukostasis or the hyperviscosity, or that we decrease the total tumor burden so that when they give the chemo, we don't have the tumor lysis syndrome, or at least we don't have as severe a tumor lysis syndrome, right? So the usual course, okay, is to process somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 10 liters of blood. Some people will say, well, two blood volumes, in an attempt to reduce the white count. And again, there is no correlation between the degree of reduction and survival, right? So what we really want to do is we want to look for resolution of symptoms. Because uh, again, I already alluded to the fact, and we'll talk a bit more in a moment, we're going to want to focus on treating symptomatic patients. So if that patient comes in and they're obtunded, we want their mental status to improve. If that patient comes in and they are having a very poor uh, blood gas and poor oxygenation, um, we want to improve their, their blood gas and, and their PO2. Okay? So we really want to drive our therapy by following symptoms. So sometimes I'll get, you know, somebody will say, well, I want, I, I want you to do three of these cytoreductions. Well, you know, if the person gets done and their symptoms are resolved after the very first cytoreduction, we're done. And if the symptoms come back, I'll be there. But I'm not going to go ahead and do another procedure necessarily in an asymptomatic individual. So, Jeff, one question for you with that, because I think that's a really important point. I have seen people um, in different places. I've worked in a lot of different places, so uh, I've, uh, I've, had, I've seen a lot of different approaches to this. But I have seen people that are, <clears throat> pardon me, I've seen people that are monitoring the uh, the white count, for example, very carefully during the procedure. They'll send CBCs during the procedure to see, oh, are we below X number? Are we below X number? So am I, am I understanding correctly that, that in your view, that's far less important than how's the patient doing? What are the symptoms that the patient's having? You got it exactly. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There are different ways to skin the cat, and there are different ways to practice. Um, but again, my goal is I want resolution of symptoms because my goal is really um, in those symptomatic individuals to, to treat them till they're gone. In the people that are prophylactic, where they're not symptomatic, but maybe I'm going to have a concern. You know, we'll talk in a moment about that. Um, I may monitor a count, but I'm going to check them post procedure count because routinely I can get a 50% reduction in their white count uh, with a procedure where I'm processing uh, that 8 to 10 liters. And that's talking about AML or uh, potentially an ALL. Now, um, where that fails in my experience is if you have somebody with chronic myelogenous leukemia and the AMLs are rising from that, and basically what happens there is you debulk their spleen because oh. they all come in with a big, huge spleen, so you will not see the degree of reduction that you would anticipate, but uh, their spleen's smaller. I, one other thing I want to point out that's really important, really, really important, you got to shut off production of these cells. Okay, you're going to lose. You're not going to be able to beat out those malignant cells in the marrow that are producing uh, the blasts and coming out. So our chemo colleagues need to give some form of chemotherapy to begin to shut down production. Uh, otherwise, it's a losing game. Um, now, that doesn't need to be their full course chemo. Frequently, it's just hydroxyurea. Um, but they need to give something to, to at least shut off or slow down production. If they don't do that, you're, you're, you're going to lose. You're, you're not going to be able to get a significant reduction. Uh, you may not be able to get any reduction at all. Uh, before we move on, any, any other technical things about the procedure that some people do or some people don't? Yeah, the other thing I need to mention is this, uh, and, and this, there's a lot of variability in practice with regard to this. Um, sometimes, especially if they're more mature cells, the density of the, the white cells, the leukemic cells, is pretty close to that of a red blood cell. And so you have um, poor separation of the white cells from the red blood cells, which leads to a poor 
um, uh, uh, removal and reduction. And if you can then give hydroxyethyl starch as part of the procedure, so we'll mix up an anticoagulant that includes hydroxyethyl starch. And this is a sedimenting agent. It, it basically eliminates the zeta potential on that negative charge on the surface of the red blood cells and leads to Rouleau formation of the red cells. So that clump of red cells is going to be more dense now than that white cell that I'm trying to remove, and you'll have cleaner separation. Uh, we did a study through the American Society of Aphoresis retrospective data, but looked at centers that did and did not use HES, and uh, the take-home points were this. One, we saw a greater degree of reduction in AML if HES was used. Uh, we also saw a greater improvement in uh, pulmonary symptoms if HES was used. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so Jeff, uh, in the interest of time, let's let's move on and let's talk about what the ASPA categories and recommendations are for this situation. So, um, ASPA category for leukostasis, basically symptomatic leukostasis, symptomatic hyperviscosity is a category one. That means a primary treatment modality, okay, with a recommendation grade of 1B. So, a strong recommendation to do it with B category evidence. That means controlled trials, but not randomized controlled trials. So moderate quality evidence. This is, again, treating symptoms. The person is symptomatic. You want to treat them until the symptoms go away. Okay? Um, prophylaxis. That means they're not symptomatic, but they have an elevated white count. Okay? So that is a category three indication, meaning the optimum role for apheresis is uncertain. You need to individualize it. So again, you're going to look at your patient. You're going to say, wow, this is a young person. Um, maybe it's a young woman, very, very fit athletic type, um, no significant other comorbidities, no coronary artery disease, and they're at uh, 150,000. Maybe I'm just going to watch them. On the other hand, here's this guy over here. He's got bad atherosclerotic vascular disease. He's older. He has other comorbid conditions. I feel uncomfortable. He might stroke on me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and treat this individual. And as a general rule of thumb, the criteria are, again, 100,000 for AML, 500,000 for ALL, and as I mentioned, CML really don't unless they're turning into AML. And I failed to mention CLL, which again, usually we're not treating. Uh, by the way, the prophylaxis is a grade two recommendation, so it's a weak recommendation. And it's based on C quality evidence, so low to very low quality evidence. So, Jeff, before we leave uh, cytophoresis, I do want to ask you one more thing because you, you, you hear about this in, in textbooks and, and articles sometimes, and that's, um, is there any form of AML that you might want to think twice before doing uh, leukoreduction on? Yeah, so you'll hear people talk about not doing uh, cytoreductions on, on M FAB M3, so the uh, promyelocytic leukemias. Um, and and the, the, the thought there is that you put those cells into the centrifuge and you get them all nice and angry and they degranulate, they kick those hour rods out, and uh, you, you'll, you'll lead to that uh, DIC the, that, that can occur in the setting there. Now, now i got to be honest with you. There are times in the middle of the night when we did not know what the type of leukemia was. We did a cytoreduction reduction and oops, the next day it's an M3 and nothing happened. Right. So there is that concern. Uh, so I think if you know coming in, uh, probably avoiding site reduction in that setting is, is reasonable, especially given that you have the uh, retinoic acid uh, analogs, those, those drugs that can quickly mature those cells um, and, and basically resolve a lot of the symptoms. So yeah, basically there's another more effective therapy, I would say, and you avoid this sort of potential complication of, of the development of the DIC. Okay, Jeff. So I, I do have one question before we get into this, the specific details of, of the, the, the cytophoresis uh, things that we're going to discuss today. And that's this. Many people listening to my podcast are uh, blood bank workers. They're, they're other laboratory technologists and sometimes students. They're, they may be pathologists that are not involved in therapeutic apheresis every day. Obviously, many people that listen, this will directly impact them. But for those that don't necessarily see a reason why they need to know about this, what can you tell us? Why why do people need to know about what these things are, what we need to do for them? Well, if for those people in the lab, let's say, the technologists who are not going to be supporting, who are not going to be performing these procedures, they may be supporting them by setting up blood products for transfusion to these patients, 
Okay. Um, in some instances, and we'll talk when we get onto the red cell exchange, uh, by actually uh, helping select an appropriate replacement fluid for that red cell exchange. So they have to have some sense of what these procedures are to understand what it is that they're doing to support these procedures and what their role is and why it's important. Obviously, physicians, uh, for the trainees and the residents, Somebody might ask you questions about that on a <laughs> test somewhere, right? Okay, so that's why you need to know it. Uh, but again, you may never know where you're going to end up working, and you may find yourself responsible for uh, helping uh, guide some of these uh, decisions and being in charge of a unit. Okay, Jeff. So th- thanks for that uh, that excellent summary of of getting rid of getting rid of nasty white cells. So let's let's talk about something else. Let's talk about let's talk about platelets. What happens when we have too many platelets? What are the things we should be thinking about there? Well, bad things happen. So <laughs> yeah. thrombocytosis uh, is defined as greater than five hundred thousand platelets. Okay, and uh, it can be due to a number of different causes, primary or secondary. The primary ones are. Uh, polycythemia vera, uh, agnogenic myeloid metaplasia, essential thrombosthenia. Things you don't necessarily think about from a secondary standpoint is, you know, hey, that person that was just in the automobile accident and had to have their spleen removed. So uh, increase in platelet count post-splenectomy. And interestingly enough, if you have uh, uh, real bad iron deficiency anemia, you can actually bump your platelet count up because there's some cross-reactivity between erythropoietin and thrombopoietin. Your body's saying, make red cells, it can't, so instead it makes platelets. But what can happen is one of two things. You can either bleed or you can thrombose. So if you bleed because you have too many white count, well, excuse me, too many platelets, um, it's usually mucocutaneous. So we're talking about nosebleeds, uh, bleeding in the lips, bleeding in the gums, bleeding in the skin. If you thrombose things, it can be either microvascular uh, or macrovascular. So you can have thrombosis in the uh, capillaries in the skin, and you can get erythromelia, this sort of painful, purpuric sort of uh, rash. Um, Or you can have macrovascular thrombosis. You can thrombose a a superior sagittal sinus or a bridging vein uh, on the surface of your brain. You can thrombose a coronary artery. You can thrombose a vein in your lower extremity and, and throw off a DVT. So all of these are, are not good for you. Jeff, is, the, is there any correlation between the um, – forgive me for interrupting. I'm sorry. But is there any correlation between the primary and secondary causes of thrombocytosis and, and the risk for those? Yeah. So the uh, primary causes – so back again to our essential thrombosthenia, our polycythemia vera – they have a much higher frequency, uh, roughly 56% of individuals who, when they get that count over 500,000, are going to experience some complication. On the other hand, the secondary causes are pretty uncommon, only 4%. So really what we end up usually treating are those primary causes. So what determines whether or not somebody bleeds or somebody clots, right? So there are some risk factors. So the risk factors for thrombosis are increasing age, If you've had a previous clot somewhere, okay, and the longer you've had the elevation of your platelet count. So if you think about it, at least with regard to increasing age and previous thrombotic event, as we all get older, our vessels get grungier. Uh, If you have a previous thrombotic event, your your, your vessel isn't normal. And and so the the plumbing is bad, okay? And that's what happens. For bleeding, um, interestingly enough, if your platelet count is extremely high, greater than 2 million, uh, you're at increased risk of bleeding. Um, what ends up happening is you actually develop sort of an acquired von Willebrand's disease-like state. Your platelets are slurping up all the von Willebrand's factor in your blood and can't interact appropriately with your uh, endothelium in the presence of uh, injury to the, the vessels, and you bleed. Um, the other thing is somebody looks at your platelet count and they say, ooh, this is really high. I better give them some aspirin so that they won't clot. And then they bleed. So really, extreme elevations greater than 2 million and, and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Those, those are the risk factors for bleeding. Okay. Okay. Well, so Jeff, I'm I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb here, and you may you may cut me off of this limb, but I'm gonna go out on it anyway. I'm gonna say that since since uh, 
apheresis has been ar- around for a long time since we we've had people with high platelet counts for a long time that surely we must have done a ton of really great trials on how well reducing someone's platelet count in these situations uh, works. Am I right? You're wrong. Uh, not at all. There are actually no controlled trials. So this is one of these things where uh, really what ended up happening was people said, oh, look, their platelet count's high. Uh, they treated them. Their symptoms improved. And they said, wow, isn't that wonderful? And <laughs> nothing further was done. I mean, think about it. If you were the patient experiencing neurologic symptoms because your platelet count was really high and I came to you and said, hi, I want to enroll you in a randomized trial and you may either have a stroke because I'm not going to treat you, I'm going to give you a sham procedure or not have a stroke, would you, know, would you agree? Probably wouldn't, right? So it, it's, it's one of those things that uh, we haven't had trials. We probably never will have trials in this, in this context, at least randomized controlled trials. Okay. So, uh, but, but I guess we can, we can talk about kind of general practice. And but before we get to the technical aspects of this, let me ask you this. Is this somewhat analogous to to leuka reduction in in that you're not necessarily treating magic numbers but you're treating the, in particular the things that you described thrombosis and hemorrhage is that a fair way to look at it exactly so once again um we're going to treat symptoms predominantly and to be honest with you I sort of, once again, don't really care what somebody's platelet count is if they are symptomatic from it. And I feel certain that they're symptomatic from it, right? So, uh, you know, you'll hear people talk about treating when the platelet count gets greater than a million. Well, you know, if somebody comes in, their platelet count's 750,000, and they are having what appear to be symptoms related to occlusion of the microvasculature, neurologic symptoms, because of these platelets. I'm going to treat them. I'm not going to treat a number, okay? Uh, there are, and we'll talk in a moment, some, uh, you know, people will say, well, you know, there's an increased risk of these complications, especially in the primary cases, when the count's greater than a million, so they'll go ahead and do prophylactic treatment in that context and in that setting. Uh, what are the what aspects do we need to know about how we do it? So again, um, we process, you know, um, depends. People will do one to one and a half blood volume. Some people will do um, uh, fixed time. They'll say, okay, three hours. We're going to process for three hours um, with, again, the goal to resolve symptoms because no correlation between the platelet count and the complications. So if they're symptomatic, you want to make those symptoms go away, okay? Um, and as with the leukocytophoresis, we got to do something to shut off the production because we're going to lose. We're not going to win that battle. We need to shut off the production of the platelets. So that, again, tends to be giving them hydroxyurea uh, at the same time that we're initiating the uh, platelet reduction therapy. Again, just like white cells, roughly a 50% reduction. Your, your, your mileage may vary depending upon your institution and how you do things, but roughly in that ballpark, okay? Okay. Okay. So, so what does that mean for us in terms of our, in terms of our ASFA categories and recommendations? So for the ASFA categories, symptomatic is uh, currently a category two. So that's a second line therapy. Okay. So theoretically, what you're going to do is you're going to start treating them with medications. Now saying that usually the medications are not, um, they, 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 they don't, don't, don't kick in. They don't shut down the production quick enough. Okay. So you may need to add that. So category two, and we've already told you, there are no randomized controlled trials in this context. So this is a grade 2C, so a weak recommendation based on low to very low quality evidence. Okay? Okay. Um, the prophylactic treatment, that is, uh-oh, their white count, or their, excuse me, white count, white count, play the count is greater than uh, a million, um, okay, or treating individuals who have secondary uh, thrombocytosis, right? Because, again, they, they rarely have complications, okay? Um, that's a category three. Again, the optimum role is uncertain, and it should be individualized based on that patient. So, again, you're going to look at the total, some total of the patient. What uh, is their other comorbid conditions? How healthy are they, et cetera? Um, and that, again, is a recommendation grade 2C. It's a weak recommendation based on low to very low quality evidence. You want to hazard a guess as to what the highest platelet count I've ever seen is? 
Oh, okay. Uh, ooh, let's see. I'm going to say uh, 2.9 million. Yeah, 7 million. <laughs> it was in a young woman who was an ultra marathoner and was completely oh, wow. asymptomatic. Get out of here, really? And I'll be honest with you, we looked at her, myself and the Hemonk doc, and we scratched our heads and we said, do you want to reduce her? And he said, do you want to reduce her? And we both said, there, she's asymptomatic. And we said, seven million is scary. We reduced her. We cut her in half. She went down to about three million. We both stared at each other again and we said, okay, we're good. And we let her sit at three million and she did perfectly fine. Wow. She had uh, a central thromosthenia. Okay, so Jeff, we have we have covered getting rid of nasty white cells. Uh, we have covered getting rid of of nasty platelets. Um, I'm obviously oversimplifying slightly, but but I like putting it that way. So let us talk now about. We're going to spend the last few minutes talking about what to do for patients who have red cells that need to be exchanged or removed. So let, so why don't we? Uh, I'll let I'll let you take the lead. Uh, what would you like to say about that? Yeah. So, you know, there are actually a number of indications that are pretty rare. We're not going to talk about those, but we'll talk about the common one, which is sickle cell anemia, right? So, again, you have this abnormal hemoglobin that polymerizes uh, at a low pH um, and uh, in a hypoxic environment. You get these sickled red blood cells that occlude the microvasculature and lead to, well, hypoxia, which leads to more sickling, which leads to more hypoxia, which leads to more sickling. And you end up with this sort of chronic hemolytic anemia punctuated by these um, crises, okay? These crises that are triggered by the sickling. Now, there are a couple of ways you can treat sickle cell anemia, right? You can give them acute trans, simple transfusions, okay? So you're just replacing their oxygen carrying capacity by transfusing them, okay? You can give them chronic transfusions where you give them chronically transfuse them and try to suppress their marrow production of their uh, hemoglobin S containing red cells. And then you can do red cell exchange where you basically remove the evil red cells, those containing the hemoglobin S, and replace them with red cells off the blood bank. Now, you might say, well, why in the world even bother doing red cell exchanges? Isn't that complicated? Let's just top them up, right? Let's just, let's just give them some red cells. The problem is that their endothelium isn't normal. It's been damaged from the sickling. And, and even the red cells that they have that aren't sickled, let's say they were once sickled and now they're not sickled, those red cells aren't normal. And so the red cells are sticky, the endothelium is sticky, and so what ends up happening is that you increase their hematocrit, you start increasing viscosity. Well, what does that do? Decreases oxygen delivery, leading to hypoxia, leading to sickling, leading to more hypoxia, leading to more sickling. So with acute, simple transfusions, you can actually make the situation potentially worse. So when you have somebody who has one of these crises that is due to the sickling, um, you can do the red cell exchange and avoid increasing their hematocrit, uh, at least into the realm where you start seeing increased viscosity, and hopefully avoid those. You can also do the red cell exchange uh, sort of as the kickoff, the initial uh, part of uh, embarking upon the chronic transfusion protocols to suppress their own marrow productions. Because again, you can not boost their hematocrit up really high that they start having problems with uh, oxygen delivery. Okay? One of the, one of the thoughts behind um, red cell exchange transfusion versus acute simple transfusion, you mentioned viscosity. I'm totally with you on that. Uh, can you address the iron issue between those two? So these again, you know, hey, that guy that gets shot and bleeds out 50 units of red cells and you give him 50 units, his net iron balance is equal, right? But that's not what's going on here. So they have a chronic hemolytic anemia. You are addressing their anemia by transfusing them. That iron is going in, but the body does not have an effective mechanism for excreting iron. Okay? Basically, it's sloughing your epithelium and sloughing the lining of your intestine. That's how we get rid of iron. Uh, sort of bleeding. And so those simple transfusions will lead to iron overload. Whereas if you're doing an exchange transfusion, you're putting in what you're taking out, and there are methodologies, which are not getting into the specifics, there are hemodilution me methodologies where you can actually remove red cells at the beginning. So you're removing the evil hemoglobin S containing red cells at the beginning. You're not replacing them, but you're giving them a uh, uh, crystalloid solution to keep them euvolemic. Okay. And then you do the red cell exchange part, 
And what you're doing then is you're, you're, you're getting them to that hematocrit you want. You, you can give fewer red cells to, to get to that uh, fraction of cells remaining uh, that you want of less than 30% containing hemoglobin S uh, in giving fewer red cells. So you're giving them less iron. You can actually start to deplete their iron stores in that setting. I think people that, that are beginning in our field, people that are learners are often surprised at uh, when you say, when you say boosting the hematocrit up in someone with sickle cell, that number is a lot lower than we might think in someone who doesn't have sickle cell, right? Right. But they're compensated, right? Right. They're extracting uh, oxygen and they're good to go. So, you know, you see this patients with sickle cell anemia wandering around with, let's say, uh, crit at 21, hemoglobin at 7. That's where they live, and they're fine. They're going up and down steps. They're walking down the street. If you and I had that acutely, uh, we'd be flat on our back and probably not conscious. Um, <laughs> but but they live there. And so I've sometimes seen individuals, I've seen physicians maybe who aren't used to dealing with these patients say, oh, well, we need to transfuse them to a normal range. We need to trans whatever that is. We need to transfuse them up. And, and that actually could trigger one of these crises because... They're fine where they're at. They don't need to go higher, but by transfusing them, you suddenly cause them to paradoxically not deliver as much oxygen. Is there any kind of general rule of thumb uh, numbers that you want to try and avoid in in patients with sickle cell? I usually try when I do the red cell exchanges, I, I try not to get their final hematocrit at the end of the procedure above 30% because it's when you hit that range, you start seeing that paradoxical decrease in oxygen delivery. Right. Yeah. And that, that, that's, again, the, those of you learning this field, that it's really important to recognize that this, this is vastly different uh, than, than other settings that where we, where we might be doing red cell exchange, the, the rare ones that we're not talking about today. But, but in sickle cell, you, your target is considerably lower than, uh, than, than what we think of in other scenarios. So forgive me for that little sidelight, Jeff. That's, I think that's important. I think that's an important, that's the take home message. That, that's very important because I've seen confusion on that topic. So the crises that end up, uh, there, there are a number of different crises that, 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 that can be treated uh, with red cell exchange. I should mention there are two different types of red cell exchange. There's manual and automated. Manual is basically drawing a unit of blood out of one arm while you're giving a unit of blood in the other arm. Okay, uh, it, it can be done. It's simple. It's straightforward. Uh, it's not as efficient or as effective as doing it automated when you're hooking up the apheresis machine. But in certain parts of the world where you don't have that spiffy apheresis device, uh, manual exchange is, is perfectly reasonable. Um, and it also may be appropriate in the setting of people with very small blood volumes, like pediatric patients, uh, neonates, and, and very little the, the people with not much of a blood volume. Okay. Um, so um, I think um, probably what we'll do is we'll talk a bit about the different crises when I talk about the ASFA indications at the end. So can we, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the technical aspects, okay? Okay, So sure. I mentioned one of them. Our goal, uh, really what we're doing is we're removing the hemoglobin S containing red cells and we're replacing them, okay? And I already alluded to the fact that the usual target is to have a hematocrit of roughly 30%, no greater than that. Sometimes you, you can't get that high, so you get as close as you can, okay? Uh, basically, programming the device, you can't get there. Um, the other thing you try to do is that you, you, you'll hear people talk about the fraction of cells remaining, or the FCR, and that uh, that is you want the cells, the total number of cells, the percent of cells that have hemoglobin S in them at the end of the procedure to be less than 30%. So 30-30, 30% hematocrit, less than 30% uh, fraction of cells at the end of the procedure having hemoglobin S in them. Uh, some people will use a little less than 30%. I've, I've seen people use 20%. I've even had people request 10%. Frequently, that's, that's difficult to obtain uh, without using a lot of blood products, okay? Now, the replacement fluids that you're going to give them, okay, are red blood cells. Hey, that makes sense, right? <laughs> That's pretty simple, yeah. yes. Now, there are a couple of things you need to consider when you're looking at what the replacement fluid is, okay? So first of all, uh, since you're actually, one of your endpoints is to have less than 30% uh, hemoglobin S, yeah, I want these cells not to have hemoglobin <laughs> S in them. I can follow that, I think. <laughs> okay, so you want to actually test... You want to test your cells for hemoglobin S. You say, well, wait a minute, what, what, 
why, why would they have hemoglobin S in it? Well, you have to remember that the majority of individuals, obviously, who have uh, sickle cell anemia are going to be of African ancestry. And their um, antigen profile in their red cells is going to be different than a Caucasian blood donor, right? So sometimes these people have antibodies towards those Caucasian antigens, and you're going to select red cells that are negative, and those are going to have a higher probability of being from somebody from African ancestry, and they might have not sickle cell disease, but they might be a sickle carrier. And so you're going to try to test that. And you're going to measure the amount of hemoglobin S at the end, right? Hemoglobin electrophoresis to determine, did I achieve my goal of less than, seven, than, less than 30%? Right? So test that. We usually will also use a leukoreduced blood product. Why? Well, because these people are going to get a lot of transfusions. If you're not removing the white cells, they're going to be exposed to them. They may develop antibodies to HLA. You know, really at this moment, the curative treatment for sickle cell disease is a bone marrow transplant. And if somebody has a bunch of HLA antibodies, that's going to limit donor sources, right? Uh, and if they run into other problems in the future, you might not be able to transfuse platelets to them because of the HLA antibodies. And then finally, these people have a chronic hemolytic anemia. They're going to get a lot of red cells over the years. And um, so one of the things that we frequently will do, most centers will do, is match for not only those uh, red cell antigens that they might have antibodies to, but they'll match uh, for a subset and give them uh, match for uh, things to prevent them from developing antibodies, okay? So a lot of places will match for big C, little c, big E, little e, uh, and uh, KELS, K1, okay? Um, and, and if you do that uh, in the STOP1 trial, um, basically they saw a reduction of the rate of uh, aluminization from 3% per unit of red cells received to 0.5% per unit received and a decrease in their uh, frequency of delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions by 90%. If you extend that out and start matching also for big S and Duffy A and Duffy B, because remember, Favorite board question, right? African Americans, Duffy A neg, Duffy B neg, high percentage, right? Okay. But if you go for those, then you're going to even further reduce the rate of aluminization. Okay? Right. And of course, that's balanced with how difficult it may be, depending on the person's antigen profile, to to match. That can be that can be a challenge sometimes. Yep. And your and your blood supplier and what you got available and all the rest of that stuff as well. Um, so again, whether you use the, the type of red cells you use really is not that important, whether you're talking about additive solution or CPDA1 or what the, what the preservative is on them, right? Um, you, you just need to know what the hematocrit is because you got to program that in the machine, okay? Um, and then you, we, we tend to try to use the freshest ones possible, that is the, 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 the rationale being that the fresher they are, the longer they survive, the less likely we're going to have to come back and, and try this again, you know, and, and do another exchange or do something something else. Okay. Let's hit the highlights, shall we, of the uh, – of the, because, folks, I got to tell you, we could have made this entire podcast about red cell exchange in, in sickle cell. It's a big, big subject, complicated subject, but we wanted to give you this as uh, just some highlights. So, Jeff, rock and roll. What, what are the, what are the take-home points? I want to mention just a few, okay? So there are more than this that the ASFA is categorized, but I just want to hit a few high points. First of all is acute stroke. So either prophylaxis for uh, uh, stroke or actually somebody who's experiencing a stroke, okay? So again, these people have bad vessels. They are not delivering oxygen. So for acute stroke is a category one, so a strong recommendation to actually do the procedure. Uh, category one, so primary treatment with a grade one, strong recommendation, unfortunately based on uh, low quality evidence. For prophylaxis, uh, for primary or secondary stroke, okay, so so preventing them from having a future stroke, uh, it's a category two indication, so it's a second line therapy. First line would actually be the, the potentially the chronic transfusions to suppress their own marrow production and 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 decrease that. But again, you can you may have difficulty with the oxygenation and triggering those sickling crises. So you can add red cell exchange uh, either as all of the transfusion support or for the first part of that chronic transfusion support. Again, category two recommendation grade one, so strong recommendation, but low quality evidence. Uh, acute chest syndrome. 
Acute chest syndrome is when they have sickling that leads to decreased oxygenation. So sickling in the microvasculature of the lungs, okay? Um, well, if they're hypoxic, they get more sickling, which makes them more hypoxic, which makes them sickle more, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is a category two indication, so it's a second-line therapy. You usually try to address the, the, the initiator of the, of the acute uh, chest syndrome, which frequently is an infection, it's pneumonia. But if these individuals begin to worsen and they start getting worse and worse, then you want to intervene with uh, doing the red cell exchange to try to basically uh, uh, abort this cycling around, circling around the drain. Okay, uh, that is a uh, strong recommendation, so grade one. Uh, but again, low quality evidence, uh, category uh, C. Um, the other one that I want to mention uh, is uh, prep, prepping people for surgery. Um, so um, basically, there have been studies that have shown that really. Uh, Good anesthesia management, that is avoiding hypoxemia, avoiding uh, acidosis during the surgical procedure versus transfusing somebody, they're equivalent. Um, so this is actually a category three indication. So the optimum role is uncertain. It should be individualized on the patient uh, with a weak recommendation based on high quality evidence. That's that, that the trials that have actually looked at this. So in this setting, if you have anesthesiologists that are used to dealing with these people, right? Um, you really don't need a red cell exchange. If you have anesthesiologists who aren't used to dealing with these people and there's concern that maybe um, they might have hypoxemia or acidosis during the procedure, then red cell exchanges may be appropriate. But you're going to want to base that on the patient, not only on the patient, but your, your facility that you're at. Jeff, we have hit a lot in an hour, man. That was a lot of info, but I think you presented in a in in a way that that's not only memorable but but useful for us. So so thank you so much for for taking the time to go through all these with us. Okay, well, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, maybe we'll do something else in the future. If you're if you're, I'm, I'm willing. If you're willing. Thanks so much for hanging out with Jeff and I for that discussion. I hope that you have a better feel now for the red, white, and yellow therapeutic apheresis procedures we discussed on this interview today. Remember, for continuing education credit, you can directly visit www.wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news. The other thing I'd love for you to do is give your feedback and comments on the show, pay, show page, I should say, at bbguide.org slash 049. You can also give Give your feedback on iTunes, which I would really appreciate as well. I hope you'll join me again in a couple of weeks when I will have the return of the fabulous Sue Johnson from Blood Center of Wisconsin. She's one of my favorite people. And she'll be here for my landmark 50th episode. Sue and I will start a two-part discussion on the essentials of pre-transfusion testing. And shh, here's a little secret. There might just be a giveaway. Woo! <laughs> so don't miss it. So until we meet again, my hope is that you'll smile and have fun. And above all, never, ever stop learning. We'll catch you next time on the podcast. Bye.